to give ourselves the opportunity to enter into fellowship with God, naming and citing any known sins if we have any, and also if there's something that might be disturbing or distracting to us, now is not the time to concentrate on any of our problems, but now is the time to give our undivided attention to the Word of God as it is being spoken. And therefore, with that in mind, let us pray. Father, once again, we are grateful and thankful that you've given us this privilege and opportunity to gather together with members of the royal family, to look into the word of God, which is alive and powerful, to go forth in your plan in spite of the obstacles that Satan would put in our path, and to continue to grow in your grace and in your knowledge. So may your blessing be upon this evening's message and all that we'll be noting. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. All right, uh, turn to Romans chapter 9. Of course, verse 4 is our subject. And last evening we pointed out the evil of anti-Semitism and God's promises concerning the Jewish race. And when I talk about anti-Semitism, I'm not talking about anti-Arab. I'm talking about anti-Jew and how evil it is for churches even today to be negative toward the Jewish people who are still God's people and are still under the promises of God in due time. So last evening again we pointed out the evil of anti-Semitism and God's promises concerning the Jewish race. And the phrase that we've been noting in Romans 9.4 is our subject when Paul tells the Gentiles he tells the Gentiles, the church age believers, he says that they who are Israelites, to whom is the adoption, and we've already studied Roman adoption as it was in the ancient world where they had, were adopted as adult sons, and as sons, and the glory, that is the Shekinah glory that we spent about a week on, and the covenants, or as we will see, the unconditional covenants, and uh, the gift of the law and the worship of the true God and the promises, which of course is the manifestation of the integrity of God. Now what does it mean? We had the phrase last evening, I gave you the Greek words for and the covenants. Well, it, it, is, primary, uh, it is referring primarily to the Abrahamic covenant, though uh, the others are included in the Abrahamic covenant as well. We will study the Abrahamic covenant in some detail, but we must begin with a descendant of Shem. And when I talk about a descendant of Shem, I'm talking about a man called Abram, and who for 99 years, Abram was an Arab. He was an Arab, and the Arabs claimed him as one of them. And he was one of them up to age 99. But then at age 99, God started the Jewish race, God claimed Abraham for himself and started a brand new race called the Jews. The Jews are actually the youngest race in all of, in all of human history. And therefore, let's begin with a profile of Abraham so that you will know something about him as an Arab and how he became a Jew. For this applies directly to the wars in the Middle East that have been taking place for thousands of years. And again, Satan is trying to destroy the Jewish race. He's trying to destroy Israel because he wants them not to be around when God fulfills his word and fulfills his promises, which of course is a losing battle. But you see, when you're arrogant, you don't take into account that you can lose. Arrogance always makes you think that you're right. Arrogance, according to the Bible, makes you stupid. It makes you stupid, it makes you dumb, it makes you without common sense, usually without a sense of humor. It makes you judgmental, it makes you critical. 
filled with criticism. And that's exactly what a lot of people are today. And so here is Satan, the father of arrogance, the creator of arrogance, still thinking that he can defeat God and destroy the Jews. So we'll begin with the profile of Abraham so that you'll know something about him as an Arab and how he became a Jew. And this applies directly to the wars in the Middle East even today. Abraham was originally called Abram uh, in the Bible before God changed his name. Abraham was a Gentile. He was one of us, we're all Gentiles. Abraham was a Gentile, and being a Gentile, he, was, he, was, uh, he became a Jew only when God started the Jewish race through him at age 99. And that was when Sarah was beyond menopause, and it would be an impossibility for the women at that day and age to uh, ever have a child. And yet Abraham was promised a child. And as you know, he was uh, not waiting. He did not wait on the promises of God. He took, uh, he took uh, Sarah's maid, and he took Sarah's maid to, to uh, actually bring forth the child. And he brought forth Ishmael, who was the father of the, human, of the Arab race. And therefore God made uh, uh, his promise, he fulfilled his promise through uh, Sarai, who was later called Sarah, in the uh, promise of giving her the promised seed. And the promised seed, of course, would be Isaac, not, uh, not the man called Ishmael. So he is, Abraham is, was the ninth generation descended from Noah's son, Shem. Shem is the son of Noah. Noah Shem was one of the three sons on the ark, and, uh, and the ninth generation descendant was Abraham, or Abram, from directly from Noah's son, or Shem. That's why we call it anti-Semitism. Now, Abraham was born in the city of Ur, about 2161 B.C., and this passage that we're going to look at now, go back to Genesis chapter 11. <clears throat> This passage actually brings up what we're going to see, picks up Abraham around 2086 B.C., where he had just entered uh, Canaan, or was about to. And the accounts are found about Abraham are found in Genesis 11, 26, 11 verse 26, all the way to Genesis 25, verse 11, where he died, with the focus on four important aspects of his life. And we're going to note those four important aspects. First, his migration, or his moving from one place to another. Abraham's story begins with his migration with the rest of his family from Ur of the Chaldeans in ancient southern Babylon, which has to do with Iraq today, by the way. Iraq is still the center of the world. Genesis 11, verse 31. And so in Genesis 11, verse 26, we read the story of Abram when he was born. And Terah, that's Abram's father, lived 70 years, and he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. And Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishkah. And Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, he and, his, he and his family actually moved north along the trade routes of the ancient world and settled, settled in the flourishing trade center of a place called Haran. That place called Haran is important in our study. Several, um, several hundred miles to the northwest. While living in Haran, it was while living in Haran at age 75 that Abraham received a call from God. 
not the moon god Ur, who is the god today called Allah, the god of the Arabs. And he received a call from God, Elohim, to go to a strange unknown land that God would show him. And Abraham actually did that. And remember at the time, it was a strange unknown land. So he had to believe the promise of God. And so we remember at that time in human history, there was no Bible, so God spoke personally to those whom he chose. He even spoke through the stars, through astro astrology, when it was being used in a correct way and not in a demonic way as of today. Now the Lord promised Abraham that he would make him and his descendants a great nation. This is according to Genesis 12, 1 through 3. This is the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And notice this, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. That's true today. How many Arab Arabian nations have been cursed? How many uh, nations like Germany have been accursed? How many anti-Semitic nations have been accursed? And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, such as the United States of America, because we are not, we are not anti-Semitism. We are pro-Semitism, even though there are some anti-Semitism uh, uh, people in this nation. However, like many promises from God to his people, because they, they are so fantastic, such as the rapture, they seem to be unbelievable. And the promise must have seemed unbelievable to Abraham because his wife Sarah, called Sarai in the early part of her life was childless and had no children. In Genesis 11, 30 and 31, in Genesis 17, verse 15. So back in Genesis 11, verse 26, Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now Terah was what we call an Akkadian. He was an unbeliever, and in Joshua 24, 2, he was an idolater. And as this passage says, he was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now his name Terah actually means delayed. And he is well named for he delayed Abraham from getting to the place where the Lord wanted him. He represents family members who delay those who have positive volition from doctrine from going forward in the plan of God. For instance, if some of your family members had their way, they wouldn't have you go forward in the plan of God. You would not be in a church on a Thursday night or a Wednesday night or a Friday night or a Tuesday night or a Sunday morning. You wouldn't gather together that many times. You do what the average carnal believer does go to church once a week and think that they're spiritual. And so terror delayed Abraham's advance. And that's because Abraham was an individual who was very, very compromising. And he compromised his, with his family over God. And he delayed the calling from God because his father, Terah, was still alive. And he delayed from uh, Abraham from getting to the place where the Lord wanted him uh, to be. God had a plan for Abraham, but as long as Abraham stuck with his father, he was delaying, he was delaying the fulfilling of the will of God. And there are certain members in your life that as long as you let them get to you and stop your momentum, they will delay your spiritual life just like they did to Abraham. Now the king of Ur, was a very known, well-known worshiper of the moon god called Ur, who I told you is the current day god called Allah. And Ur was the great center, the city of Ur was the great center of the moon god worship and all forms of idolatry. The city was a prosperous center of religion and industry and surprisingly, 
advanced in culture, particularly in the arts and the crafts. The city of Ur was, uh, uh, was, uh, was famous for uh, the building of its ziggurats. You remember the city, the ziggurats that were here. The, uh, Ur built the famous ziggurats of the ancient world, a system of terrace plat uh, plat platforms on which temples were erected. And they would actually go up the stairs and go up to the high stairs and go, there would be idols here and idols here. They'd have an idol over here, an idol over in this corner, an idol over in that corner. And then on top of this would be the god Ur. And it was actually a city, uh, almost like the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, 3 through 4, a seven-story a seven story ziggurat made of brick. So it was a very high-class city. Now, Abraham was saved in this city. He was saved in this city under the most unusual circumstances because, you see, Ur of the Chaldees was a great, powerful empire. However, it was totally destroyed after... Abraham left, destroyed after Abraham left. His home area was completely destroyed. And Abraham left Ur to go, to, uh, to, to go north and then south down to Canaan. And on his way to Canaan, Abraham passed the Amorites. The Amorites were a fantastic military organization who were on their way to destroy his home area called Ur. And it's interesting because on his way to Canaan, he passed the Amorites and Abraham was not living in Ur at the time when the prosperous religious city Ur of the Chaldees collapsed. Now, if Ur had a lot of believers in it, then Ur would have been spared. But the Lord was going to have Ur destroyed. Therefore, he told Abraham, get out. And when God is ready to discipline a nation, and the nation is about to go under some form of, of, of discipline, like the fifth cycle of discipline, he will tell his people, get out of that nation. The pivot was too small, and I'm going to destroy that nation, but I'm going to deliver those who are my people. And at that time, there were only three believers in Ur. There was Abraham, there was Sarah, and Lot. Not enough to save Ur. The pivot was too small. So the Lord takes the pivot out, just like he'll take the pivot out of this nation if we continue to go downhill in our morals and values, or if we get involved in moral degeneracy, or if the conservatives start taking away freedom. Remember, remember we are not a nation under God. We are a nation that is free. We allow people the freedom to choose their own God, and we don't hinder Christianity from functioning. People call us a Christian nation. We are not a Christian nation. We are a client nation, and in a client nation, God gives people the right to choose the God that they want to follow. So the Lord took the pivot out, only three people, and then he went ahead and he destroyed one of the greatest empires in the ancient world, the third dynasty of Ur. Now, Abraham's spiritual life was very limited. It was very limited in Ur. You see, he was in, involved in Ur, and that was very, he was very limited when he was in Ur, that city. That city limited his uh, spiritual life. And he needed to get to a place where he could learn doctrine without being distracted. Like a lot of you have to make decisions in your life. You have to get out of a situation that you're in, a situation that's hindering your spiritual growth. It may be a geographical uh, situation. It may be a relationship. It may be uh, leaving your so-called friends and uh, your social life. But Abraham's spiritual life was very limited in Ur, and he needed to get to a place where he could learn doctrine without being distracted. Remember the first commandment when God said, he shall have, I will have no other gods before me. Your God could be your family. Your God could be your wealth, your income, your job, business. It could be your social life. It could be friends. It could be anything in the world that takes the place of God and distracts you from your calling. For the most important thing that you do in life is take in the word of God. That's why the Bible says he magnifies his word above his very own name. So you may be like in Abraham where your spiritual life has become limited and dull 
And it's because you're in the place of Ur. And you need to get out of that place, out of that situation, out of that relationship where you can learn doctrine without being distracted. And you may find out that your spiritual life is limited. That your spiritual life is limited. It's a limited spiritual life. And why is it limited? It's limited because the place where you are or the people you are with become a stumbling block to your spiritual growth. Again, the place where you, you are becomes limited, you see? The place where you are, the place you may find out that your spiritual life is limited because of the fact that the place where you are or the people you are with become a stumbling block to your spiritual growth. So the principle, in many cases, geographical change, geographical change is necessary for spiritual growth. Can't get my pen working again tonight, so I'll try another side. Geographical change is the, is the place, it is, is necessary for spiritual growth. If you have to get involved in spiritual growth, you have to have a geographical change. Now we have to start with the family. The family that stays together, it doesn't pray together. The family that stays together is all mixed up. We know that according to the word of God. We'll see that. Abraham stuck with his father and it hindered his spiritual life. That was a mistake because his father led him down the path to reversionism. Now Abraham had a normal family. It was a normal family like all of us do, fighting with each other. And of course that's normal in our day and age. We know when no one has the perfect family that gets along. And if you do, then you don't know what's being said behind your back. But there was some family love here because they married half-sisters. Now, we do not do that kind of thing today, thank God. But then we're going to find out we do, do a lot of things that Abraham did. There's a lot of things that he did that we don't do today. For example, Abraham was one of the largest slave owners. He was one of the largest slave owners of the ancient world. And uh, he owned a lot of slaves. And we don't do that any longer. We have outlawed slavery in our, in, in our nation. Though slavery is, pa is a practice in other parts of the world. His father also, his father also uh, Terah, was the priest of the moon god. So he was following another religion. And uh, the moon god who was called Ur as well as one of the wealthiest men in the prosperous city. So you have to start the life of Abraham or Abram in a place that was so prosperous and so secure speaking, so it was so secure humanly speaking that no one ever dreamed that the dynasty would ever come to an end. It's very difficult to leave a place of prosperity. It's very difficult to leave a place of security. It's very difficult to uh, leave a place of comfort where everything is going right and you know if you make another decision and it's the wrong decision, you might lose all that you have. But sometimes that is a part of the calling of God to challenge you to have the faith that he will bless you in the new situation that he's leading you to. So uh, it looked like a safe place and a sure thing. A lot of things look like a safe place and a sure thing. You might be dating someone and you look, think that it's a, sh a, a safe and sure relationship. You might be taking a new job that has more money and you might think it's a safe and secure uh, uh, geographical location. But you have to be very, very careful because a lot of people are, have that welfare or social security mental attitude where they depend upon others and depend upon the government for their needs rather than depending upon God. So Ur of the Chaldees was a great powerful empire. However, it was destroyed right after Abraham left. Why? Well, because the Lord Jesus Christ controls history. The Lord Jesus Christ controls history, and since he knew that what was going to happen to Ur, he got Abraham out. It looked like a great place, Abraham. It looks like a safe place. You're making a lot of money. You're very prosperous. You've got good relationships there, good family life, but you're worshiping the wrong God. 
You're worshiping the God of this world who is Satan rather than the God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And this is why we should always be sensitive to the leading and guidance of the Lord because he may be leading us and guiding us to a place that doesn't seem a lot better than the one that we're at. And you never know when it's going to save your life. However, the only way to be sensitive and, and, uh, and to the, uh, sensitive to the leading and guidance of the Lord is to know his word, Bible doctrine. And that's why Satan tries to destroy the intake of the word of God. That's why there are obstacles placed in your path. Some of you are here right now this evening because obstacles were placed in your path, but you overcame them. Excuse me. And you had obstacles placed in your path. However, to be sensitive into the leading and guidance of the Lord, you need to know Bible doctrine. Now, when Abraham left Ur, it was, it was entering into the peak of its prosperity. And he appeared to be leaving a sure thing. You see, this is a sure thing. He appeared to be leaving a good thing, but it wasn't. It looked like a short thing. It looked like a good thing, but it wasn't. But he le therefore he left. And how did he leave? Well, we know how he left because the New Testament tells us. Go to Hebrews chapter 11 in <clears throat> verse 8. Remember the phrases in uh, Hebrews 11:8 by faith in the original language means by means of doctrine, by means of faith, by means of the Christian faith. Therefore, by means of the word of God, by means of doctrine is our, tr our translation. So it's not, um, faith is not something that we think of today like hoping something's going to come through. Faith is a substance. It's a solid substance. It's something that you believe. Faith, one of the definitions of faith is the Christian thought pattern, the Christian way of life, or Bible doctrine. So we read in Hebrews 11, 8, tells us how Abraham left. He didn't leave blindfolded, hoping that everything would be all right, but it was by means of doctrine resident in his soul. Because he had the word of God resident in his soul, Abraham, when he was called, when he was called by God, obeyed, notice he obeyed, by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. Notice he was to receive it. So he had to have faith that God was going to come through for him. And he believed the word of God. And he went out not knowing where he was going. God just told him, get out of Ur. And he got out of Ur, and God said, I'll lead you to a place where I want you to be. So it's by means of doctrine, resident in the soul. Abraham, uh, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place where he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. This verse brings out the importance of resident doctrine or residual doctrine in Abraham. He had residual doctrine in him positive volition, and being motivated by doctrine before reaching spiritual maturity. He wasn't even in spiritual maturity as of then. It wasn't until Genesis chapter 22 when he was willing to offer his son as a sacrifice that he was in spiritual maturity. Secondly, the change of geographical location was the basis. It was the basis for separating Abraham from his family and relatives. And sometimes that's going to happen to you. You're going to have to change your geographical location. And it might be just getting out of the city you're in. It might be a, a mental uh, change of geographical location where you're no longer in contact with certain people, certain members of your family, certain friends in your social life who drag you down or make fun of that which you believe, or mock that which you believe. They try it out once or twice, and then they mock it. They never give it a chance. You can't come here once or twice and then have an opinion. That's an impossibility when the preacher has taught over a thousand sermons. Listen to the thousand sermons, then you'll come to the correct conclusion. It's like walking into a movie, sitting down for 10 minutes, and then leaving and saying, I saw the movie, it stunk. 
That's what people do when they come in once or twice and, uh, and they sit down and they leave and they're critical of either the speaker, critical of the rules, critical of the building, uh, critical of anything they can criticize because they're looking for an excuse not to go forward with a serious relationship with God. And a lot of people cannot seem to handle the relative thing, the family thing. You see, the change of geographical location was the basis for separating Abraham from his family and relatives. And the principle is that when family or relatives hold you back, then family has to go and relatives has to go. When family or relatives when members of your family or members of your, or members of your relatives hold you back, then family has to go and relatives have to go. A lot of people cannot seem to handle the family relative problem, but Abraham did. Now, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, something that I don't want you to misunderstand, but it is a biblical truth, which I'm going to back up with certain passages that you've seen before, but families are not important. The true family that you have is the royal family of God. The one that I address every Sunday by saying, good morning, royal family. Your family is the most important thing in your life, and that is your royal family, not your blood family. Your blood family is not the most important thing in your life. And if your family is more important than anything else in life, then you are not living the Christian way of life. Now let me prove this with some passages from our Lord. Go back to Matthew 10, look at verse 34. Matthew 10, 34, in that very popular passage, our Lord said it to his disciples, to his followers. Jesus said it, not me, not the pastor at Grace Bible Church. Jesus said it. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Notice that the man's enemies will be members of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. Chapter 12, verse 46. Notice what the Lord says in this passage. Again, that's, that passage in Matthew 10, 34 through 39 is crystal clear about the relationship between the family and the one you have with the Lord. While he was still speaking in Matthew 12, 46, while he was still speaking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Those are the key words in the passage. They were not inside listening to him. They were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Now again, the background here is important. Our Lord's mothers and brothers apparently came to him for reasons noted in passages like Mark 3.25, where it says when, he, when, when his own people, his own family, his own family members heard of this, what was it that they heard of in context that he claimed to be the Son of God? They went out to take custody of him. We've got to have him put away. We've got to have him put away. They went out to take custody of him. For they were saying, he has lost his senses. They said, my son, is, Mary, the mother, said, he's lost his senses. He's nuts. The brothers and sisters says he has lost his senses. He's gone too far with this thing. And notice that his own family, including his mother, thought that he had lost his senses and that he was out of his mind. And so they did not come to believe on him or to listen to his teachings or to follow his teachings. They came because they thought that he was going nuts. He was taking this thing about being God a little too serious. In fact, his own family we're told in John 7, 5, did not believe in him, for not even his brothers, his four brothers, were believing in him. In fact, they did not come to believe in him until after his resurrection when he appeared to his brother James, his half-brother James. Even his mother was mistaken at this particular point. 
So in Matthew 12, 46, while he was still speaking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Notice that they're standing outside. They didn't want to even come in to listen to him. And this verse also tells us that they didn't want him to speak to them. They wanted to speak to him. Someone said, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing, standing outside seeking to speak to you. Not seeking to hear what you have to say, seeking to speak to you. And it doesn't say our standing. We have a perfect active indicative. The verb is hestekasin, H-E-S-T-E-K-A-S-I-N. In the perfect tense, it means they have been waiting for a long time. They have been waiting outside for a long time. And what did the Lord say? Did he say, come on in, give them front row seats? No. He answered the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. And he went into the principle that whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. So you see, the Lord Jesus Christ even taught that his followers, he taught his followers are even closer to him than his natural family. His followers are even closer to him than his natural family and closest relatives. And that was, that was that were those, whoever does the will of God. In fact, we are told that his disciples took the place of his earthly family because they had believed in him. That's why it says that whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, which is to believe in the son, he is my brother and sister and mother. And remember the will of God is summed up in one verse for us in the New Testament. First Timothy 2.4. He wills all men. What's the will of God? He wills all men to be saved and come to the epinosis knowledge, metabolized doctrine of the truth. So whoever does the will of my father, what's the will of my father? To be saved and come to the epinosis knowledge of the truth. Those are my brothers and sisters and mothers. And so relationship with God must have priority over relationship with people. And if you've got someone and you're not here this evening because someone um, uh, took you away, then you have a relationship with that person that is wrong. If you have let people take you away from Bible doctrine like some have in this local assembly, and it usually happens just around the springtime, so it's coming very soon. When they start having spring, love is in the air. And they start having love in the air and they start getting involved in relationships and they get involved with the summer life and uh, see you in September, they can sing to the pastor. <laughs> see you in September. Remember that song? It's my generation. Talking about my, 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 my. Remember that song? <laughs> well, anyway, let's get back to this before we have some visitors that think I'm Connell. Your number one priority demands that you have a right relationship with God. And as an expression of this, emphasis on people over God must be set aside. Emphasis on people over God must be set aside. And by emphasis on people, I am referring to people including yourself, your very own desires and your very own will. If we recognize that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Lord, that he is our Lord, then we will put Bible doctrine first in our scale of values if we recognize that he is Lord. And so the greatest issue that we have always in life is Bible doctrine more important to you than the most intimate ties of life? Is it more important to you than your relatives, your family members, more important to you than your mother, your father, your children, more important to you. And by the way, if you have children and you can't come out late at night to Bible class because they have to be in bed because they go to school the next day, well, you have a couple of options. You can get the tape, you can get the CD, you can get the DVD, or you can listen online. There's no excuse not keeping up with your pastor's teachings with the technology that we have today, especially in this local assembly where there is no charge for any of the teachings, even in written form. So the issue is, again, is Bible doctrine more important to you than the most intimate ties of life? Whether it's family, friends, loved ones, success, 
pleasure, social life, sex, status symbols, materialism, or wealth. And there's a very important principle here being brought out by the life of Abraham. The glory road, the greatest issue is always doctrine versus the details of life. The glory road is always doctrine first. The greatest issue is always doctrine versus the details of life. The glory road, which is saving grace, you're saved by grace, not by works that any man should boast. Faith alone in Christ alone. Not faith plus repentance of sin. Not faith plus walking an aisle. Not faith plus asking Jesus into your heart. Not faith plus asking Jesus into your life. But faith alone in Christ alone. And then you go from saving grace to living grace. You're living in grace. And then you grow to the different stages where you reach super grace. Now you have super grace. Then you go to dying grace where you die in grace, and then you go to the ultimate surpassing grace in the, in the eternal state, was not open to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldea. It was not open to Abraham, the glory road. It was not there. He had to change location. And Abraham was getting doctrine in Chaldea, but because of his family and relatives, Abraham never hit super grace until he was totally separated from all his relatives. He had to be separated, especially from his father, because he highly respected his father. He had to be separated from his nephew Lot. You know what happened to Lot. Lot got in a lot of trouble because he didn't separate. And therefore, it was necessary for Abraham to have a permanent change of residence. His spiritual growth was the most important thing. So Abraham was uprooted. He was uprooted again. He had to be uprooted in time so that he would be rooted forever in the eternal state. And you're going to find out that your life is going to be a life where you're going to be uprooted in time. And things are going to change drastically. And it may be a divorce. It may be a geographical location. It may be a change of churches. It may be leaving friends behind. It may, may be leaving success and materialism where you, you can get more if you go the devil's way because he's the God of this world and he can bless you. But... You have to be uprooted in time if you're ever going to be uh, rooted forever in the eternal state. Because you see in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, you're a citizen of heaven. You're not a citizen of Rhode Island or a citizen of Massachusetts or a citizen of the United States of America. You ultimately are a citizen, a citizen of heaven. Study the word polituma, the polituma privilege, the privileges of your heavenly citizenship that we have on file. So he left social life, family life, relative life, friends. He was leaving a place where he was well known and apparently a place where he was even appreciated. And that is always the big deal. You, le you see, to leave some environment when you're appreciated or in some cases you think you're appreciated, but you're being appreciated is also keeping you from getting Bible doctrine is a big deal. A lot of times people say, well, I'm going to stay in this church. Why? Because I'm well known there. I'm popular. I've got a higher position. If I go to that church, I won't even be an usher. And right now I'm considered to be one of the assistant pastors. I'll stay in a place of promotion. And to leave some environment when you're appreciated, or in some cases you think you're appreciated, but you're being appreciated is also keeping you from getting Bible doctrine, is something that you have to do. Note also the principle of supply and demand. Abraham had positive volition. His positive volition demanded the presentation of doctrine. Doctrine was available to him in the Ur of the Chaldea, where his hometown was, up to a point. Then it was time to leave. He had to leave because he was no longer getting doctrine. And when it ceased to be available was when God had to uproot Abraham and get him out of there. And it ceased to be available when Abraham's family and relatives and friends and social life and perhaps even his celebrity ship, when these things got in the way of his advance down the glory road, then God had to remove him. There's a lot of people that stay in churches because that's where their family is. That's where their relatives are. Their friends are there. Their social life is based upon that. And they, they are celebrities. They're popular. And when these things get in the way of your advance 
in the spiritual life and your intake of Bible doctrine, these things, those things have to go. And that's when the Lord gives you that crossroads, that time at the crossroads where you have to choose one or the other. I set before you life and death. Choose life so that you may live and not death. Choose between God and Baal. Choose between the God of this world and the God of the universe. Choose between going forward in grace and faith or choose between sight. You have to come to a point where you make those decisions. And whenever there is positive volition toward Bible doctrine, God provides the spiritual food, even if it means a change of residence. In our day and age, a lot of people don't have to change residence because they can still get doctrine uh, positively through the internet, through technology. But there are times where doctrine is not even provided anywhere and you need face-to-face -face te teachings, the best type of teaching. And where there is positive volition toward doctrine, God provides the spiritual food even if it means a change of resonance. The circumstances in Ur of the Chaldea limited against Abraham from becoming a spiritual champion, invisible hero, and finally a visible one. And these limitations is what stopped him from becoming, uh, growing faster in God's grace and knowledge. And therefore the importance of the change of family life or the environment and circumstances. God provided enough doctrine, but Abraham could only go so far in the environment of the influence from family, friends, and social life. When his family and his friends and his social life began to influence him and take him away from doctrine, he used to come to church during the week, but now he's not only going to church on Sundays. Oh, he'll listen, he'll say, on the Internet. But while he's listening, his phone's ringing, the kids are crying, there's knocks on the door, they're also watching a TV show at the same time or vacuuming with headphones on. You're not taking in doctrine that way. No one can take in doctrine while they're vacuuming unless they're terrible, terrible housewives and they don't vacuum at all and they leave the vacuum on and then stand in one place. But it's kind of funny to be vacuuming and have your neighbors hear you say, wow, I believe with that. I agree with that. And they don't, they don't see that you're listening to a tape or something. Things can be weird among your lives when you don't put doctrine first. That's the deep spiritual principle there. Now, now, God provided enough doctrine, so, and he provided enough doctrine so that Abraham could have that change of environment and circumstances. Whenever environment is not conducive to the persistent, positive volition to our doctrine necessary to keep pressing on, pressing on, pressing on, pressing on, no matter what, no matter what happens, no matter what they say about your church or your pastor or the people in it or the, uh, or the building or whatever, They'll say anything about anything. These people are absolutely critical asses. And they're the kind of people that are your friends because they judge you. And when they're judging you, they take the judgment off them and they put it on themselves. And we had something recently just happen in the front of the building. Jim, uh, Deacon Jim Mello was uh, um, uh, vacuuming or doing the leaves outside. And some, some guy pulled up in a car and said, is Pastor McLaughlin still teaching here after all that garbage he got into? And Jim Mellon said, who are you to judge? And the guy just flew off in his little red car, or he had red hair. Or he, I don't know, he probably had red, hair, red face after that. But people just love to stick their nose into other people's affairs. They just always believe, believe what the media has to say. I don't believe the media anymore. I don't even believe sports anymore. I can't even believe that the Giants beat the Patriots. I can't even believe that the Red Sox won the World Series legitimately. You can't even hardly believe anything anymore. There's all lies being perpetuated. People are trying to def athletes are trying to def uh, defend themselves against accusations that they're using steroids. Uh, politicians, the worst thing you can do is be a politician and run because they're going to dig up garbage when 25, 30 years ago, oh, what did you do there? Did you ever smoke marijuana? Uh, no. Yes, I did, but I didn't inhale. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I didn't inhale. That was a waste of weed. <laughs> Gee. Well, let me, get, let me get on here. 
God provided enough doctrine in Ur of Chaldea to give Abraham the inner doctrinal resources and strength to obey a command for a change of residence. Repeat, God provided enough doctrine in Ur of the Chaldea to give Abraham the inner doctrinal resources and strength to obey the command for a change of residence so that he would go forward in that plan. And when Abraham obeyed, he did so from the motivation of doctrine in the soul. Doctrine in the soul motivates the believer to come to doctrine class in spite of whatever distractions were attest to you. And there could be many. And this brings out that principle of separation. Separation from, first of all, is a time uh, to separate from certain people. You can separate from. It should be applied to both believers and unbelievers in the cosmic system, especially those who seek to influence the believer in the pre-designed plan of God to leave the plan. Therefore, there must be a separation from those loved ones or friends who are in the cosmic system who drag you away from Bible doctrine. However, and this is a very important principle, it does not have to be a physical separation. You can stay in contact with these people. You can treat them with impersonal, unconditional love. You can honor them and treat them as a brother or a sister and always show them the respect that you would show any member of the royal family, but you do not let their thought pattern drag you down in their system of thinking, take you away from doctrine. You're above them. You're not below them. They're not to drag you down. You stay on top of things. You can still be in contact with them, write to them, have physical contact with them and, and enjoy their company but they have to know that we, they have to know where you stand in relationship to your uh, your God and your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and so therefore there must be separation from those loved ones or friends residing in the cosmic system but it doesn't have to be a physical separation in fact there are two categories of separation from people the first one is mental separation and mental separation there is a one one-way antagonism from those in the cosmic system toward you. They'll mock you, they'll make fun of you, they'll mock what you believe, but you see, your volition protects you from becoming antagonistic toward them. They can be bitter, you can still work around them. They can judge the boss and judge others, it doesn't matter. They can gossip, you can't change, you can still do your job. Your volition protects you from becoming antagonistic toward them by your use of impersonal, unconditional love. And that's the kind of love where you love people because of who and what you are, not who and what they are. Mental separation emphasizes the integrity, and the honor, and doctrinal application of the believer residing inside the pre-designed plan of God. I've got someone right now that's trying to do something very evil to me, and I have the ability to do the exact same thing back to them. Uh, someone who wants to make accusations against me, and I have the proof to make the very same accusations against them. But I'm not sure I want to lower myself to those lower standards and, and play the game of revenge. Remember, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and I will revenge those who especially attack God's anointed. And uh, it's interesting how people are free to make accusations when they forget about their own shortcomings and their own failings and other things that are around their own family. Impersonal love is not influenced by those loved ones who are residing in the cosmic system. You're above them. You don't get dragged down to their level. You don't let them drag you down to the swill of their garbage and their gossip. And you look at their spiritual life and you'll see that it's gone. It's totally gone. They have no spiritual life. And God will not provide a pastor teacher for them because they've left under the wrong circumstances and they've left in arrogance rather than humility. So impersonal love is not influenced by those loved ones who are residing in the cosmic system who are apostate and antagonistic toward Bible doctrine. Impersonal, unconditional love functions on its own integrity and perpetuates its own priorities from the metabolization of Bible doctrine. You operate in integrity even though they may be bitter and revengeful and judgmental. You have integrity, integrity in your soul. Impersonal love does that. It functions on its own integrity. Impersonal love emphasizes 
personal love for God. And I don't want to sin against God, so I won't get angry. I don't want to sin against God, so I won't be jealous. I, won't, I don't want to sin against God, so I won't gossip. Gossip is bringing up something that is true about a person, by the way. I, won't, I don't want to sin, uh, uh, sin against God, so I won't malign. That's bringing up something that is not true. Either one is wrong. Even mentioning someone else's uh, sin is wrong. Even if it's an alleged sin, it's wrong. If it's a legitimate sin, it's none of your business. For your God and my God says, your sins and your iniquities I remember no more. And when a Christian brings up the sins of another Christian, they are honoring Satan as the God of this world and living in lack of integrity. They are not living in the royal family honor code and they will be disciplined. It may seem like they're winning, but they are losing. And their life with God will never be right until they get themselves right with man. And that's a lot of people think they can go around getting, doing anything they want to Christians and getting away with it. But God has a plan. And trust me, God always wins. And therefore, impersonal love does not compromise the believer's status inside the pre-designed plan of God. Why? Because he has mental separation. Mental separation, in contrast to physical separation, avoids maligning. You don't have to have physical separation, but you avoid maligning, you avoid judging, you avoid hating, you avoid criticizing, seeking revenge, hurting those with whom you have been intimate with in the past. Because when you have been uh, intimate with people in the past, they know your weaknesses, they know your failures because you trusted them back then. Well, you no longer trust them, but they still have that information. It's like the cockatrice egg in the Old Testament. And those, those negative thoughts and the things that you said to them at times of intimacy hatch. And they'll accuse you of them. And they'll come right against you. That's why you be careful of the friends that you make. Mental separation, therefore, not only emphasizes integrity and honor, but avoids destruction for the spiritual life as you live inside of the pre-designed plan of God. And mental separation does not compromise those things, you see. The second one is physical separation. And mental separation, in contrast to physical separation, is where we will pick it up tomorrow evening for we're out of time. Father, thank you again for the power of the Word of God and your truth that's so, pop, so po powerful and so right and protects us from hurting ourselves and living in self-induced misery. We pray that you...